Hello, everybody. My name is Daryl Karp. I'm the director of the Museum of Australian Democracy. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional elders and the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people, and pay my respect to elders past, present, and emerging. I'd like to particularly welcome you all here to the 2020 Parks Foundation oration in this beautiful members' dining room here at Old Parliament House, whether you're on site or visiting remotely via our live streaming. There are some special welcomes tonight. Mark Kenny, Professor of Australian Studies, uh, uh, Professor at the Australian Studies Institute at ANU and our 2020 orator. Karen Middleton, journalist, author, and moderator of our Q&A session later tonight. The Parks Foundation Chair, Ian Tom. Catherine Gray, the secretary there. Um, Professor Sally Wheeler, Pro Vice Chancellor for International Strategy and Dean of the Robert Garron Professor of Law at the ANU. Professor Paul Pickering, Director, the Research School of Humanities and the Arts at ANU. And Professor Frank Bongiorno, Head of the School of History at ANU. And most important, Ngunnawal Elder, Auntie Violet Sheridan, whom I would like to invite to welcome us to country. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, the last time we were about two years ago, so hopefully everything's getting, well, I'm not gonna say normal. Hopefully everybody can start moving forward again and people can get together and uh, we do the things that we used to do. But hopefully, cro fingers crossed, we can find a cure for this awful, awful disease that's taken so many lives, particularly in America. Uh, I think it was over 200,000 have died in America. But I, I better not say it because he's driving me insane. I'm just hoping <laughs> Joe Biden wins. <laughs> so a stubborn, stubborn man who won't listen, <laughs> um, particularly to the people that know what they're doing, the health experts. So that's just how I feel. And I'm really, really happy because I'm also a greenie. The, the Greenies have won five seats in the ACT. How wonderful is that? <laughs> Maybe we can go back and look at families can get a bigger blocks of land now for their money. So that's, um, that's my beliefs anyway. So I'm, I, I originally come from just outside. My family have lived here for many years until they decided to build Canberra. So when they decided to build Canberra, they said, well, we just got to get rid of all these Aboriginal people. So they forcefully removed us to Yass and out to Queenbeam, where my family lived out there, and um, also Ride Park. So no one knows that, uh, uh, people probably do know, that Yass has had the most um, Aboriginal reserves around New South Wales. So that's uh, where I um, come from, but my family have lived here for many years, the Ngunnawal people. And I have four children and 26 grannies, two great-grandchildren. Happy, just hope they stop now for a little while. <laughs> so every time a formal welcome is given, it continues a tradition that has always been a part of Aboriginal culture, except maybe for a lapse of about 200 years. It was always given by way of welcome when permission was granted to visit a different tribal area. When we talk about traditional country, we mean something beyond the dictionary definition for the word Aboriginal Australians. We might mean homeland or tribal or clan area. We might mean more than just a place on, on the map. For us, country is a word for all values, places, resources, stories and cultural obligations associated with this area. And it's featured, it describes an entity of our ancestral domains. It is on this land, maybe possibly right here where we live, we are tonight, sorry, that my ancestors cared, lived and raised their families. Uh, and, I, and I've really, really loved being back here because the, the Museum of Democracy has so much stuff. And across the road is the Ten Embassy, which still stands there and I still support it because it has this government, the Australian government, has unfinished business with us Aboriginal people. So we want a treaty and sovereignty rights, so that's where my, my heart is. So I'd like to pay my respects to my elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people as well. I'd like to acknowledge the great-grandson 
uh, of Henry Parks in Thomas, uh, the members of the uh, democracy, Henry Parks, Orientation, Mark Kenny, and all of you. It's good to see your faces and we're out and about again. So keeping in the general spirit of friendship and reconciliation, it gives me great pleasure this evening to welcome you all on the lands of the Ngunnawal people. And thanks you so much. God bless and take care. Thank you, Auntie Violet. The Parks Oration is an annual event focusing on challenging social or political issues facing Australia. This is the third time we've held the event here at MOAD as part of our long-standing partnership with the Parks Foundation. It's, it happens alternate years, and in the alternate years, it's at Tenterfield. We're privileged to have many of Henry Parks' descendants, great, 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 and great, great, great grandchildren who are joining us both on site here today or via our live stream. The Henry Parks Foundation is a great patron of MOAD. This year, their support has enabled us to expand our digital schools programming, connecting with students all over Australia in real time through green screen technology. And Ian Tom made a very recent donation. In fact, it's barely two hours old. At 4.30 this afternoon, he donated an original copy of The Empire, dated the 9th of April, 1851. It was printed on Henry Parks' Albion Printing Press, which is on display in our Truth, Power and Free Press exhibition in the Lower Gallery. The newspaper will shortly go on display alongside it, and I encourage you to visit, or if you haven't, if you've already seen it, to revisit that exhibition. It is now my great pleasure to welcome the chair of the Parks Foundation, Ian Tom, to say a few words. Thank you. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, we really appreciate being here at MOAD, uh, and it is really great to be back. And I also endorse your, your comments about Auntie Violet's moving and so personal a, a welcome to country. So thank you, Violet. As Daryl has said, this is our third time here, and uh, we have established a terrific relationship with the museum, and it's been getting stronger every year. Daryl, we thank you for the dedicated team, you and your dedicated team, that have, you know, look at it, it's fantastic. Uh, and the ongoing support you've given us is really, really appreciated. And again, thank you for your custodianship of, of Henry's Press down there, uh, and I do also encourage you to have a look at it. I mean, the digital world, this is a one-man operated, two-levered press to print a newspaper, uh, all for tuppence. And just by way of housekeeping, on the completion of Mark's oration, our 2016 orator, Karen Middleton, or should I say Dr. Karen Middleton, congratulations on your recent appointment. Uh, Karen will hold a brief interview here with Mark, and then we'll open the floor to q and I, I carry the role as chairman of the Henry Parks Foundation, but as mentioned, I'm also a proud great-great-grandson of Sir Henry, and I'd like to also welcome all those other descendants here today, those watching online and the members of the Parks Foundation. The Henry Parks Foundation was established under a trust deed back in 1999 by a group of those descendants and other like-minded people. And our 2014 orator and our patron, Dame Mary Bashir, sends her greetings for tonight. The Foundation's aim is to carry forward Henry's work maintaining Australia as a just and egalitarian democratic society by encouraging Australians to find out more about their country's political and constitutional history and about how they, as citizens, can participate. Again, at our 18th oration, uh, we're a small group and we've been going on an amazing list of distinguished orators that we've had deliver these orations for us. And I encourage you to learn more about these orations at www.parksfoundation.org.au. Now let's come now to our 2020 Henry Parks orator, Professor Mark Kenny. Many of you know Mark's distinguished political career 
with the ABC, the Adelaide Advertiser, Sydney Morning Herald, The Age, and here at the Canberra Times, and his more recent role in research at ANU's Australian Studies Institute. And like Karen, he has a, a long association with the National Press Club, and is, that allows him to take a wider view across national uh, politics, the democratic process, all of those things. And of course, you'll often see him on uh, Insiders on the ABC. Now, Mark's career has taken him to amazing places. He's been to the White House, Number 10 Downing Street, the Vatican, and here through uh, Democracy 2025 at Moad, and of course, his Democracy Sausage podcast. He's covered meetings at APEC, the G8, NATO, and the climate change at Copenhagen. And with all this knowledge and experience, I feel that in these COVID unfederated times, this qualifies Mark to tell us why looking backward is the only way forward. COVID-19, the Federation, and the chance of a genuine reconciliation. Professor Mark Kenny. Well, thanks, Ian, for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. I'll make one small clarification about my political career. I'd prefer to call it a journalistic career. There may be some up the hill a bit here who say that maybe it did get a bit too political at times, but uh, nonetheless, we try and, as I'm sure Karen would agree, try and have a, uh, a delineation between political activism and, uh, and journalism. Uh, thank you also to Auntie Violet for that uh, very moving personal uh, uh, acknowledgement of country uh, and to my friend Daryl Karp uh, for her introduction as well. Let me also recognise, on, who will be on the stage later, uh, as, as Ian did, uh, Karen Middleton, uh, who only last week was awarded an honorary doctorate for the, from the University of Canberra. Uh, for her uh, for her very distinguished career. I think she's um, there is no finer or more diligent, more professional journalist in the press gallery than Karen Middleton, and it's very well deserved. And obviously I'm hoping she'll go easy on me now in the questions. <laughs> Thanks also to descendants of Henry Parks, the Henry Parks Foundation, its Board of Advisors, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. And my gratitude also to my academic colleagues from ANU who have come tonight or who are joining us at a distance and who have been so generous in welcoming me to that great university. Can I also begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, the original custodians of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I regard it as a great honour to be asked to give the 2020 Henry Parks oration. And it's so lovely to be able to do so in person, a simple human interaction consistent with this building and with the settlement of Canberra, which after all is a derivation of the word in Ngunnawal language, essentially meaning meeting place. In the era of COVID, such things as we took entirely for granted have been all the more appreciated for their denial or their scarcity as the dismal science would have it. At the same time, we've seen merely from watching the news how something as unquantifiable as social capital, a sense of national identity, community, cohesion, and two-way trust between the people and government has actually served Australia well, holding it together where other harsher societies have splintered with destructive and deeply discriminatory results. Mind you, being a bit of a wordsmith, and also someone who thinks about contingencies, I had wondered about the possibility of us all being forced outside for this oration, oration, in which case it might have been billed as on parks, at parks, in park. <laughs> Henry Parks, of course, was a nation builder, and I like to think he would agree with me that even with the value of 120 years of federation, the job has stalled, that it's time for a refresh, a refocus, a new enlightened national bargain. And I'm going to argue, as I heard Jimmy Barnes do in, reaction, in relation to his personal catharsis through writing Working Class Boy, his confronting memoir about poverty, endemic alcoholism, 
and ubiquitous violence in Northern Adelaide, where he grew up, that Australia, like Barnes claims to have been, is a nation emotionally blocked, hemmed in by the narrowness and inherent falsity of its own myth. A nation unable to move purposely forward for not being willing to look clearly back. Barnes says he can now feel much more. He can live more freely, more completely, for having articulated his violent, dysfunctional origins. Might we not also progress in looking back honestly? Parks came to the colony of New South Wales in 1838 after concluding that he simply could not make a living in England. He had already been awakened but to, the war of, sorry, to the world of words and the transformative power of ideas in Birmingham, where he'd commenced an apprenticeship as an ivory carver at the ludicrously young age of 10 years old. So in that year, 1838, he reluctantly left his country of birth and indeed left the nascent Chartist movement in which he had become active for what he hoped would be a better home in the wilderness of Australia. As my friend, the esteemed historian, Professor Paul Pickering has written, the editor of the Chartist newspaper at the time depicted Parks', Parks imminent emigration as damning proof that the standard of living for working class people was unconscionable. What must be the condition of England and what the sins of her rulers when men like him were compelled to seek the means of subsistence in a foreign wilderness, the editor wrote. Of course, England's loss was Australia's gain and the young reformist would, like so many migrants, go on to make a vast contribution to his adopted home, even if it hadn't actually turned out to be such a deserted wilderness. But I'll get to that a bit later. Pickering writes, Henry Parks was one of many radical British migrants who helped to shape the radical, uh, sorry, radical British migrants who helped to shape the political and social institutions of the Australian colonies, where, as noted, many democratic reforms were implemented a generation ahead of Britain. Parks was elected to the New South Wales Parliament in a by-election in 1854, a contest that he had skillfully turned into a referendum on constitutional principles albeit for men only. What on earth is there seditious, disloyal or un-English, he asked in his speech at the Declaration of the Pole, in extending to every man in this country the right to which every British subject is entitled? Progressive as he was, he was inevitably a man of his time. Yet just as we can use the current rate of change to project population growth or the rate of global warming, we might also credibly assert that were Parks around today, he'd be a social progressive in today's terms. That is, he would have moved on from what Pickering called his popular constitutionalism to be an enthusiastic Republican. He'd probably favour multiculturalism, marriage equality, gender equality, environmental protection and reconciliation. We can't know this, but it's a reasonable assumption. His approval of change and modernisation supports this contention, deriving from his view that the glorious revolution of 1688 had marked a splitting of the monarchical chrysalis, a flipping of the power relationship between people and the crown, essentially inverting who had the power, who was sovereign. He called parliamentary and constitutional reform, quote, a marvellous example of the progress of national sentiment. The progress of national sentiment, mark those words. All parties, he said, are growing wiser, both theoretically and practically, every year. In these comments, we can see Parks' understanding of society as a moving thing, as always a work in progress, a fundamentally different proposition from that of conservatives. His role in the unif unification of Australia's six colonies is well recognised, even though he did not actually make it to Federation himself, dying in 1896. Still, Having heard the arguments and witnessed the resistance to federation, the old parks would probably not be the least bit surprised to hear that in 2020, Western Australia's border remains firmly closed, that Queensland is at loggerheads with New South Wales, and that states have been determinedly parochial through this crisis. The 21st century ver version of parks, though, might be less impressed on the upside at the creation of the national cabinet, perhaps wondering why we had stuck so long with internal rigidities that simply haven't served the nation well. 
And he might ask why it took a health crisis and its, its accompanying uh, recession to jolt our Federalist torpor. It's been well documented that voters in Australia have tended to mark up governments and leaders for the generally competent way in which they have risen to the COVID challenge. Decades of declining trust in politicians rebounded, sending some leaders' popularity into the stratosphere. Mark McGowan in the aforementioned WA has been clocked at 90 plus percent, and even Daniel Andrews has only fallen marginally under 50 percent in Victoria. Professor Mark Evans, who works out of this very building, has done much important work on political trust and on models for modernising and revitalising our creaking democratic structures. He and I have collaborated on articles, including one self-consciously optimistic piece in May, in which we suggest the current crisis offers the opportunity for democratic renewal. We suggested a national cabinet-led process of economic reform linked to a deliberative assembly in each state, with the twin tasks of formulating the priorities for economic recovery and addressing the cracks in our democracy. Special representation would be accorded to indigenous nations in each assembly. By that stage, that was May, or very, very start of May, COVID had prompted a streamlining of, of officious federal state relations as the emphasis swung to problem solving ahead of the usual politics and positioning. So what's been made of this blue sky event since? Well, not as much as many people would have you think. And as Peter Harcher observed on the weekend, the people's pandemic induced suspension of judgment is wearing off. We hear a lot about the social license in business these days, but perhaps we hear less about the political license presented to governments confronted with national crises, if they have the imagination to use it. This licence is not merely the authority to do big things, but perhaps the responsibility to consider big changes, to transform the country. While Scott Morrison has grabbed onto the National Cabinet mechanism in preference to COAG, the goodwill and unified purpose that made it work in those early urgent months has ebbed, giving way to sniping, backgrounding, undermining and straight out public bickering. And confirmation of the government failure to capitalise on the heightened trust in political leaders brought about by the crisis came in the most recent federal budget. Record debt and deficits and another $98 million, billion, I should say, in new spending suggested a reform canvas far more sweeping than was the case on closer inspection. Intractable problems like low female participation in the labour market, job precariousness, the gender pay gap, galloping casualisation and inadequate urgency in the greening of the, the economy were largely ducked. So too homelessness and the economic linchpin of universal early childhood education, a key to greater participation by women and therefore to overall economic recovery. Leading public policy economists, such as ANU's Professor Robert Brunig, say income tax cuts and to a lesser extent accelerated investment tax breaks for business may not be the best way to spur investment and economic growth. He nominates, along with free or nearly free childcare, the replacement of stamp duty with land, land taxes and big cuts to payroll tax. But you can see the problem, right? These are state taxes and thus not in Canberra's purview. Here's a case of the Federation not serving our national interest and our politicians lacking the imagination and the courage to drive change. Where's a latter day Henry Parks when you need him? It's not like we were always bad at this stuff. We led the world in democratic machinery, things like the ballot paper itself, the secret ballot, preferential voting, compulsory attendance and female participation. But now too, we're too inclined to see the politics before the policy, why things can't be done instead of how they can. Now just moments ago I acknowledged the traditional owners of the lands that we're on. These are fine words, fine sentiments, but they are useless if they do not portend anything material or substantive. Even worse if they allow those uttering them to feel that they have met and discharged any further responsibilities. Reconciliation is a project that in my submission remains doomed until we accept a mutual starting point, a violent dispossession, official subjugation, 
and systematised discrimination. Words are important, but they are really an end in themselves. There was a golden rule among the men who wielded power here in this very building. Advice usually muttered sotto voce, never explain, never apologise, and never, ever resign. I was told this jewel of practitioner's wisdom by someone who worked here, and it was conveyed only half tongue in cheek. In the old patrician days, when national parliamentary membership was demonstrably exclusive and customs still relatively new, advice like this said much about the mentality of our elected class and even more about their narrow backgrounds. There were almost no women, few if any MPs with English as a second language, and of course, no indigenous legislators, at least not until Neville Bonner's elevation to a casual Senate vacancy in 1971. And as far as I can tell, Bonner was the only Indigenous person to sit in this Parliament House. Gough Whitlam once told me during an interview just down the road at the Hyatt Hotel how proud he was to have shared an office as an opposition MP with Tony Lucchetti, whom he described as the Federal Parliament's first Italian-Australian. Nonetheless, Lucchetti's exoticness, if that is a word, underscored the uniformity of the elected class. Yet the, never, yet the rule, never apologise and never resign, also showed that whatever the other claims they may have made to be of the people, MPs and senators saw themselves apart, a privileged stratum existing in a degree of competitive tension with the people they represented. 110 years ago, the German sociologist Robert Michels published what became known as his Iron Law of Oligarchy, in which he stated that no matter how democratic an organisation's rules and intentions when it starts out, eventually the interests of the representatives and those of the represented will diverge. It's an argument, incidentally, for term limits in federal politics, an argument, might I say, that politicians themselves never make. In recent years, the advice which is now provided to political, uh, professional, by professional spinners, crisis management consultants and the legions of ministerial advisers goes in precisely the opposite direction. At a certain point in the traje trajectory of an unfolding ministerial fiasco, saying sorry has become a tool of survival, a release valve aimed at taking the pressure out of a given furore. Some politicians have even become adept at it, recognising that at an early stage of a PR crisis that you might as well get out in front of it, admit accountability and say the words that were once considered anathema. I'm sorry, I accept full responsibility, the buck stops with me and so on, before essentially going on to do nothing more. The recent Ruby Princess disaster in New South Wales and the calamitous hotel quarantine stuff up in Victoria are cases in point but there are so many others. Sports rorts, for example, a $100 million grants program shamelessly skewed for political purposes. Combine this vote buying with the $83 million upchuck by Clive Palmer at the last poll, and money may well have decided the last election. Then there's the Angus Taylor Sydney City Council affair in which a federal cabinet minister provided a forged document to a client newspaper in order to deflate the Sydney Lord Mayor's climate change bona fides. Taylor claimed Clover Moore's council racked up exorbitant international travel costs when it hadn't. Then there's the recent Leppington Triangle land purchase where a parcel of land was purchased for almost $30 million for future expansion of the Western Sydney Airport. The actual value of the land was less than a tenth of this. And the beneficiary? A past generous political donor. Nobody is to blame, and where they are found to be in error, it often brings no sanction. Words go to a point, but they are not the point. Daniel Andrews declaring that his government was responsible for mistakes in the hotel quarantine system means little if nobody is accountable. Now it's true that the Health Minister Jenny McCarkos resigned eventually. But the Premier didn't relieve her of her post and she left only after he told the inquiry that he believed the use of private security, basically hotel bouncers, fell within her field of responsibility to manage. She, for her part, claimed to not even know about the use of private firms until many weeks after the program was up and running. We've since learned the original decision was closer to the Premier than the Health Minister, which is why his chief bureaucrat, Chris Eccles, has now fallen on his sword. This is no small matter, 
900 or so Australians have died from COVID-19, and 800 of those, more than 800 of those, have been in that one state of Victoria, nearly all traced to the hotel quarantine outbreak. Makarkos continues, continues to insist that she did nothing wrong. Former Federal Sports Minister Bridget McKenzie lost her cabinet post during the sports rorts imbroglio, not for politically interfering with the dispersal of public funds, but over the minor technicality of having not declared a gun club membership. This was frankly laughable. Gladys Berejiklian did nothing wrong either, she's insisted over and over. Yet if she were a company director, a position of far less individual power than a premier, one who had concealed a conflict of interest such as a long-term personal allegiance with a nefarious individual creating the risk of undetected influence or reputational damage, resignation would not even be a matter of debate. Besides, concealing that relationship, especially given its implications, was an ongoing decision, particularly during the two years since Daryl Maguire had been forced out of Parliament and declared politically persona non grata. Consider these questions. Would the relationship with a compromised former MP have changed some voters' view of the Premier's integrity had it been declared up front? I say yes. Could the allegiance give rise to fears of undue influence? Again, I say yes. Is this really why it was concealed? And would its earlier exposure have minimised these risked risks to the public interest? I say very likely. Saying sorry or I stuffed up while incurring no actual cost has become a tactic, part of the standard armoury of defence to be deployed at the moment of maximum effic efficacy. Words matter but a principle one is not prepared to pay for is not actually a principle at all. I mentioned this wonderful building before, which has gone from provisional parliament house to simply parliament house when it was in use, and now, of course, old parliament house. It is a favourite place of mine and many others in the capital and the broader region, the broader nation indeed. It is where I first met a sitting prime minister, Bob Hawke, and more importantly, it is where Virginia Hausiger and I held our wedding reception, in fact, in this very room, having tied the knot exactly 15 years ago, just a short stroll away down on the shores of Lake Burley Griffin. It was opened on May 9, 1927, just weeks after my father, Edward, or Ted Kenny as he was known, was born. And for me, that year has always been special, formative, part of my story. Hawke, Labor's longest serving Prime Minister, came to this place from the ACTU, another formative Australian institution, which coincidentally also was created in 1927. Ted Kenny died on this very day last year at the age of 92, and my family has today in Adelaide been holding an anniversary tribute. I dedicate this address to Ted's memory and to the place he holds in the hearts of my mother, Anne, and my five brothers and sisters. Our stories are important to us. Some of you might be reflecting on this as I mention those aspects of my own story. We connect with the personal. And the obverse is regrettably also true. We tend to disconnect from the impersonal, the anonymous. When Donald Trump was diagnosed with coronavirus, this tendency was immediately apparent. Even though Trump is widely disliked in this country, a vituperative adolescent vulgarian, the reluctance to even countenance his death, let alone admit it publicly, was palpable. Like him or loathe him, we actually know Trump. We've watched his extraordinary rise, seen his weakness. But we don't wish him dead so much as simply gone. We are better than him. Take another example. A month back, the 20th anniversary of the Sydney Olympics occurred. This was also the Freeman Olympic Games. Cathy lit the cauldron, and days later, Cathy lit up the stadium with the most electrifying run any of us will ever see in our lifetimes. Her Australianness was our Australianness. In success, her indigeneity became a kind of Australian quintessentialism. She'd overcome the best in the world that night. But to get there, she'd first had to overcome us. She'd overcome Australia itself in the 70s, 80s and 90s, and in all the decades since the First Fleet. In ways big and small, she'd been ignored, vilified 
and second class. She'd been disrespected in words and deeds that most of us will never hear, let alone feel. But on that glorious night, and frankly again just a few weeks ago when we all relived it with her again, there was our absolution. Through her stunning success, Cathy Freeman had proved that none of it was that harmful, none of it amounted to much. Here she was, our Cathy on the top step. In proving she was the best, she had absolved us of the early, earlier sin of not even treating her as equal. Indigenous Cathy Freeman was a person, a winner. But what about the anonymous others? What do we want for them? We love our country, but not enough to be honest about its brutal origins, not enough to want to square up to the damage that was done in colonising this vast, sprawling continent, not enough to tap all the potential that is here. If you step out of this wonderful building, situated on this historic alignment, out onto the most famous steps in Australia, you can see straight across the lake to the bottom of Anzac Parade and up to its other end, the beloved, the revered, the sacred Australian War Memorial. Step out the back of this building and on precisely the same axis, you gaze up at New Parliament House. The geometry of all of this, so precise, so utterly deliberate and constructed, that I'm told if you could walk that line, you'd pass through the Great Hall and under the giant flag and into the Cabinet Room itself, the nation's innermost sanctum of executive power. From either end of this magnificent axis, atop Mount Ainsley, behind the War Memorial, or up on Red Hill behind the Parliament, can be seen the whole institutional story of Australia. But let's go back out on those steps again. Cast your eyes down and closer. And Auntie Violet mentioned this as well. What do you see here? You see something that is also, in its own way, perfect. For amid all this precision planning, the manicured landscaping, and the permanent sharp-edged monumentalism sits the Aboriginal tent embassy, its improvised disorder acting as its own monument to marginalisation, denial, grudging tolerance and legal ambiguity. Here, in deliberate contradistinction, is an anti-monument, asymmetric, informal, ephemeral. Like its legal status, it speaks of what the British-Polish social theorist Sigmund Bauman called permanent temporariness. Where other institutions sit stoic and motionless in a fast-moving world so as to remind us of our enduring values, this evokes movement. It reminds us that it is our stone hearts that have stopped, that is, we that are closed and motionless. The Tent Embassy, one of the world's most enduring continuous protest sites, will have been there for 50 years and little more than a year from now. It is a credit to the simple perseverance of a people who in so many other ways, from their racist treatment in the constitution to their discrimination, incarceration and denunciation since white settlement, have just clung on. As my friend Stan Grant observed in his poetic and painful book, Australia Day, when he was born, he was counted among the flora and fauna of this country, not its citizens. And remember, he's younger than me. Grant's generous writings on Australia Day and identity eschew the usual traps of, and sim of simplicity and the accumulation of useless anger, describing this frame of history as the narrative of loss and inheritance robbed, history told from the losing end. This is an age of grievance, and grievance is a demoralising basis for identity, he writes telling us, in the contest for wounds, there can be no winner. Yet even after mounting a persuasive case for keeping January 26, Grant can't avoid the pain of continued denial, the deep emotional scars and the visceral yearning for a bilateral healing. He concludes that our constitution, our founding document, must respect what came before. It must acknowledge the place of First Peoples, because it still, and these are his words, carries the illegitimacy and stain of race. I quote him again. First peoples do not have special rights, but inherent rights. It diminishes no one to acknowledge and protect that unique status in keeping with the spirit and limits of our constitutional democracy. Two decades into the 21st century, 
I feel confident that progressives from the dawn of our Federation would be appalled at the lack of any big restorative gesture, the absence of a treaty, the refusal to brook constitutional recognition, including a voice to Parliament, the glacial pace of practical, meaningful reconciliation, the non-representation on the national flag, the failure to make financial restitution for past wrongs, including wages robbed, children ripped from families, the disrespect of Indigenous soldiers good enough to fight and die for their country, but not to be recognised as citizens, much less heroes, and of course the shocking cycle of poverty, violence, social dysfunction, conviction, incarceration and deaths in custody at an alarming level. Tonight, I'd like to propose by way of an offer to First Peoples that Australia's national access be completed, but this time properly and from the ground up. At Water's Edge, unsurprisingly the name of a restaurant located in that exact location, sits Reconciliation Place just down here on the shore of Lake Burley Griffin. And it's a fine place as far as it goes, but that's not really very far at all. I propose in full consultation and genuine partnership with the 10 embassy residents, community elders, First Nations peoples, that the institutional axle point of modern Australia's great story be marked with a truly monumental structure dedicated to and run by Australia's First Peoples. While the final design could be selected from an architectural competition in the spirit of great projects such as Canberra itself and the Sydney Opera House, I'd envisage a vast and probably largely lateral structure rising from beneath the shoreline of Lake Burley Griffin. It could feature exhibits of Indigenous art, including some or all of the collection held by the National Gallery of Australia, Indigenous history, an interpretive centre, conference space, and perhaps even a wharf for receiving international tourists, Australian visitors and world scholars ferried across the lake. The building would render in permanent architecture the foundational contribution of Indigenous nations to modern Australia, while telling of the original violent dispossession and its long tail of disadvantage. I've previously called for the placement of statues along the lake's foreshore to augment those of Prime Ministers Robert Menzies and nearby the John Curtin Ben Chifley sculpture. Both of these, all of these sculptures are brilliant, but we could do so much more. Along this section could also be situated sculptures of Truganini, Faith Bandler, Vincent Lingiari, and Eddie Marbo. And perhaps further along, we could look at some of the prominent women, Dorothy Tangney, Edith Lyons, and now the great Susan Ryan, taken just weeks ago, a trailblazing former senator from this very city. In short, this museum would proclaim a new era of partnership via a grand symbolic gesture in the form of a permanent Water's Edge Museum of Indigenous history, language, art, and importantly, political struggle. But it would also be a celebration of the oldest continuing cultures in the world. Its placement would mark a national recognition that this continent's human story did not begin in Turkey in World War I, or in Canberra in 1927, or in 1988, nor for that matter in Botany Bay in 1788. It began perhaps 60 or 70,000 years before, and it grew as this building would from the very country itself, and from a people living in harmony and profound connection with that land. A First Nations memorial a building at the centre of the nation's sweeping concave arc. From this point, the eye rises up from the Nadir at Lake's Edge to the glorious old parliament, and then onto the new, the shining house on the hill. Aboriginal Australia has waited long enough for this material recognition. Its permanence had been established tens of thousands of years before the rest of us arrived. Yet its centrality in law, in culture, in the received history remains fraught and needlessly contingent. The result is bad for everyone. Australia is a nation emotionally blocked, unable to square up to its past. As Grant says, it's time to narrow our differences and strengthen our bonds. In this way, we are all set free. Now, I can already hear the argument from naysayers that spending money on a symbolic building misses the point and would be better directed to improving the health and educational outcomes of disadvantaged Indigenous communities. Yet these same critics are no doubt happy to be spending 
an enormous amount on the Australian War Memorial expansion. So here's an idea. Why don't we stop that hotly contested extravagance and put that half a billion dollars into addressing Indigenous disadvantage? Or perhaps we could just accept that those people do value symbolism, such as the War Memorial, and then consider which is the more justified, a proper permanent recognition of Indigenous Australia's long denied history or an even grander war museum. And while we're critiquing symbolism, ask yourself this, what does it say about a nation that will spend five or six hundred million dollars expanding the Australian War Memorial when the kind of project I'm suggesting here is not even on the radar? I'll tell you what it says. It says that this is a piece of history that is not valued, not legitimate, not convenient, does not conform to our sense of ourselves. Like many here, no doubt, I've been to the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe also known as the Holocaust Memorial in central Berlin, just as I've been to Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Centre in Jerusalem. These are not easy places. There were many in Germany's political and broader community who struggled with an open permanent representation of past atrocities by the German state and by its people. But they eventually concluded that the only way back, the only way forward, I should say, from such colossal harm was to look back, to look back clearly, to settle the debt through acceptance, acknowledgement, and the new beginning this can facilitate. Germany and Germans are unquestionably better for having done so. By the same token, Australia is a lesser nation, a weaker society for the denial of proper recognition and meaningful reconciliation with this land's first peoples, the oldest continuing civilizations on earth. Henry Parks earned the mantle of father of the nation. But Britain is not our true mother country, for she was already here. The ANU's Australian Studies Institute was privileged to host Pat Turner AM recently, delivering the 2020 Australia and the World Lecture. She titled that lecture, The Long Cry of Indigenous Peoples to be Heard, a defining moment in Australia. Australia, she said, knows that there is unfinished business in relation to our First Nations peoples, referring to the Uluru Statement for the heart, from the Heart, which of course called for a constitutionally enshrined voice to Parliament. It was a mechanism to facilitate engagement, dialogue and discussion between those so far excluded and those who are elected to make laws for the people of Australia, she said. The response from government was once again not to hear our cry. This treatment merely serves to reinforce and confirm the torment of our powerlessness, to borrow a phrase from the very Uluru Statement. We were not and have not been heard, but we persist. We always do. Grant finished his book with these words. If you are not Indigenous, it is impossible to really know what it is to carry this history in our bones, to live with the memory of wounds, this was never empty. Terra nullius was the lie that haunts us still. If we are smart enough and generous enough and forgiving enough, we can write our laws and our stories and we can make a place of peace there in the space between us. In the year of Black Lives Matter and the explosion of racial violence in America, let me conclude with this observation. You don't take advantage of the comparatively lower temperature of Australian race relations by denial, by doing nothing. Rather, you seize on that goodwill, that social capital, that national unity to build a better, stronger, truer Australia. Thank you so much for listening. I'll now ask Karen to uh, conduct a short interview with Mark. I'm sure you've got lots to discuss, and then we'll open it for Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, everyone. I also acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, pay my respects to all of their elders. Just, we've just got a few minutes for me to chat with Mark here, and then I'm going to invite questions from you.
You may see in COVID times that we've changed things a little bit, so we're not going to pass a microphone around. There are two mics, one on either side of the room here. So what I'll ask you to do, and we'll only have time for two or three depending how long the speeches are that always go with the questions, um, and I'm guilty of it too. Uh, we'll only have time for two or three, but I'll nominate you, and if you can jump up to one of those mics, we'd be really grateful. Um, thank you, Mark, for a very fascinating and thought-provoking address. I would like to start with your idea about this Indigenous monument. It's fascinating to me that in a time of controversy around monuments where there's a movement to pull them down that you're proposing instead to put a new one up as a big visual statement. And I'm interested in how you would see the relationship between that kind of statement in terms of trying to change attitude and understanding of history and something like, say, our school curriculum uh, that you could argue could also be overhauled in terms of our history and that seems to me dovetails with federation as well because we still have arguments among the states about how our schools operate and the kinds of curricula that they run. Should there be a standard national curriculum that is more explicit about our history or do you think we're still very awkward and shy about that? Uh, thanks, Karen. Yeah, look, I do think we're awkward and shy about it, uh, and and you're right to say that this is caught up in the um, in the whole machinery of federation as well, because the idea of national curriculum curricula is uh, or are, are you know extremely uh, fraught business in Australia. Um, you know, the states tend to control those things, um, but I don't see these these two things as mutually exclusive at all. I mean, what what I'm suggesting here. Is something that can be that can happen in the capital, in our most sacred place, in a sense. This axis that we sit on at the moment, which I think, and maybe I'm labouring the point, but I think has this deliberate omission in it. And the 50-year existence of the Ten Embassy in this very axis speaks to this. And I think what we need to be saying is, no, no, we've had this wrong all this time and we need to fix it, and we're going to fix it in this way. And it's not, it's not the whole argument, it's the beginning of an argument. It's, it's like I say, it's a restorative gesture. It's one that costs, it's one that, like I was saying in the, in the, in the, in the address, principles that you have that don't cost you anything aren't really principles, they're just words. And I think for Australia to acknowledge properly its past, we need, we need this place. It's, I, I wouldn't just call it a monument. I would call it... I mean, one of the things... Uh, here's an interesting point. As I was considering this, I thought about Malcolm Turnbull's response to the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which most people would regard as disappointing and particularly very fast, you know, just too quick. Uh, Ref he, reflexive, almost. Reflexive, yeah. I mean, I think it actually came out on Q&A, in fact. Um, certainly the argument that he put publicly about it for the first time came out there. And, you know, he talked about it being, a th you know, the danger of being a third chamber of parliament and he talked about the danger of the constitution having within it um, essentially sort of race as a factor. Now, that, that's just, I think that just is a sort of a denial of the reality of Australia's history, of this land's history. And so I think what we need to do is we need to look at a monument like this, which is a much more active space. The third chamber of parliament question, which was basically bollocks, I mean, it just wasn't, it just didn't stack up at all. Um, but it's, it's one of the reasons why I haven't suggested that that is where you would situate that organisation. If you were going to have a voice, that might be the best place to put it, but, you know, I wasn't in the process of, or in the business of trying to sort of, you know, buy in resistance to this idea from the very moment of coming up with it. To anticipate the negative and and operate on that you know, within that framework. You mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you if I mean, if you if you're basically saying that what's going to be sitting right at water's edge is an Aboriginal Parliament, then it kind of feeds that narrative of the third chamber thing, which, as I say, was just not not based in fact. Um, and, and was rubbish, but uh, it, it worked in conservative Australia. I also want to ask you about the idea that you posed that saying sorry has become a tactic, and I wonder if you think 
and we have any authenticity left in politics anymore, if it's become so much about public relations and anticipating, mean, again, it's the same theme, anticipating uh, the negative, trying to win support, that we've lost any sight of any kind of authenticity. And if that's the case, how, how do we get that back in our politics so that sorry can be genuine? I mean, we did see, I think, a genuine sorry on, on Indigenous matters back in 2018, but there have been a lot of sorries about various things that are used, and you gave some contemporary examples as, a, as an excuse to kind of cover things up. H how do you think we, we get back to some sense of authenticity where there is some value and integrity around that word? I guess the trouble with that question is that you're saying, how do you fix politics? How do you, you know, it's a, it's a bigger question really mm. than, than just that. We, what we want is the return of authenticity, but we also want the return of accountability in our politics. And that's actually quite hard. I mean, there are so many spinners now involved in everything. The professionalization of politics, I think, has been corrosive. Uh, because there are sort of million ways that 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 people who are who, who would have been accountable years ago find ways of not being accountable now. It's almost like we're seeing officials being more accountable than ministers in a in a kind of a um, you know an inversion of the of the Westminster principle principle of ministerial responsibility. And I think we need to get back to thinking: don't worry about the politician. And and I'd say this: I might just say as a sort of a a long-term member of the press gallery and having left it. But if I could make an observation um, about, you know, how I look look back on the gallery now, and I don't look on it with any, anything like the hostility that, you know, some people bring to it, but I do think there's this tendency in political journalism to very often see things from the politician's point of view, from the prime minister's point of view. You know, he's hemmed in by his right wing or his left wing or whatever. And I think we've got to get away from that and start thinking as ordinary, normal citizens think. I think, back of that, what is in the interests of, of the people? What is in the interests of the system? What is in, and, and, and often it might be protection of the principle is a bigger thing than protection of an individual minister. So if things go awry, seriously awry, in a minister's portfolio and the minister can show they didn't know anything about it, well, they should still go. Because so what? It's one person's career in relation to a massive public policy failing, which in the case of one or two of examples I mentioned there, actually cost lives. But we're seeing almost the reverse of that with New South Wales politics, and you mentioned Gladys Berejiklian's predicament at the moment. We're seeing, if we are to believe the sort of um, zeitgeist around about this, that the public likes Gladys and thinks she's done a good job on COVID-19, so they're prepared to forgive whatever else has gone on because they prefer that she stays where she is while we're in the middle of a crisis. So how do we account for that? That's a, that's a different kind of assessment of what's in their best interests and it, it doesn't necessarily go to the principle you're talking about, about propriety. And, it, you know, it, it also strikes me we get caught up in, you know, politicians focus deliberately on legality and not on propriety, whereas you know, us old-fashioned types in political journalism believed that we were meant to hold people to account as well. So how do you account for that kind of view? Is the public always right? Are they entitled to say, leave her alone because, uh, because we need her to stay where she is? Well, that's a very good question. I, I mean, the, probably in a democracy, at the end of the day, the public is always right. I mean, they, 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 they determine these things. And I, I guess if she's in a contested position at the moment and she's got a lot of public support, that will give her considerable sucker to stay there and, uh, and that may be the outcome of this. Um, I, I think the, the difficulty with this case is that um, it, is, it seems... This whole thing seems so out of character with the presentation of Gladys Berejiklian uh, as a political uh, persona, um, that that um, people are just thinking, oh, well, you know, this is a personal matter. And I can understand that personal dimension to it. But I think if you step back from it, you, what you actually have, as I said, you know, if you put it in the realm of, like, a company director or whatever, they'd be gone. I mean, the reputational damage done to the government alone is huge. And the suggestion, the, the appearance, the risk of there having been undue influence... I mean, Labor's saying that she was a sounding board for corruption. That's what they're saying in the, in the parliament. Now, whether that's true or not, I think, you know, that, that's probably hyperbole, but 
Um, but it, it is pretty clear that there was some fairly selective listening going on and her explanation is, oh, well, he's a big, big noter and he, you know, sort of bores me and I was kind of, you know, whatever. Um, I guess that's what the public are, are relating to, you know. I mean, we all know blokes like that. <laughs> I make no comment. Um, just one final one from me before I hand over to the audience. But you mentioned, I think, early on in your oration about the cracks in our democracy and the things we've seen uh, emerge that sort of show the gaps in federalism here in terms of the, the federal state responsibilities and no one taking the blame, which is a thing that interests me as well. I think you mentioned the Ruby Princess and the quarantine inquiry. This week we've actually seen the New Zealand bubble maybe coming into the same category where, um, you know, oh, and we didn't realise everyone would end up in other parts of Australia as well. Nobody's, nobody's to blame. I mean, do you think the things that are being identified as the gaps in responsibility and this, it's not my fault, do you think there's the prospect of genuine change of that as a result of what we're going through with COVID-19 or is it all just going to pass and we're just going to carry on as we always have with the state's doing their thing, the federal government doing their thing, and we have this sort of artifice of national cabinet when we need to all get together. Yeah, I, I think it's unlikely that it's going to change in any dramatic way um, because, because essentially what, what we're talking about there is how do we, um, how do we get that big sort of game-changing moment where, where the two levels of government decide we need to streamline these things. And if, if we haven't seen that moment sort of by this stage of this crisis. I'm not sure that it's going to emerge. Um, the, the, the aged care debacle in Victoria is another one. Um, you know, and the, the Commonwealth Government was happy to glide along for a long time in the sort of haze of all the controversy surrounding the breakdown of hotel quarantine. But in fact, the, the, uh, the, the, what, what the calamity in aged care was very much and very clearly a Commonwealth responsibility. And it's endemic. It's an endemic problem. So accountability is um, it's, it's a very slippery concept now. And as I say, I think professionalisation of politics has made this much harder. And in some ways, the only path back to, back to uh, the maintenance of better standards and better accountability is to be a bit hard-assed about it and say, we're going to protect the principle. And if some politician's career, you know, is kind of unjustly abbreviated by, um, by, by some stuff up in their department that they didn't know about, well, that's actually a pretty small macro price to pay compared to a system that just ends up being unaccountable because it's the absolute, you know, that, that relationship, that exchange, that responsibility relationship between the people and, and, the, and, the, and the executive is fundamental to representative democracy. And once it's gone, the, 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 it doesn't mean anything anymore. So we really do need... I think we're at a, a fairly critical point. Does anyone have a question for Professor Kenny? Uh, yes, over here. Do you want to jump up to that microphone? Thank you. I'll try not to give the big speech. I'm Tracy Fenwick. I'm the director of the Australian Centre for Federalism at the ANU. Um, I detect a bit of anti-federalism in, in you. Um, and the reason I say that is I think you see the federalism glass as half empty. Um, so the states don't have to agree within the spirit of federalism. And consensus is not a characteristic of federation or federalism. Um, and I say this because federalism isn't supposed to serve the national interest. And we know it also doesn't serve um, indigenous representation, and that, that's a global federal phenomena. Um, it is supposed to encourage diversity with unity and policy experimentation and laboratories of democracy. And as a scholar who's written about policy responses in COVID um, comparatively, Australia stacks up very well in comparison to the US, Brazil, India, and even Canada. So my question about looking at federalism as the glass half empty, I'd like to encourage you to think about the counterfactual, because we did have positive outcomes in terms of policy diversity. So the counterfactual of Australia was unitary, and we didn't have interstate borders to put up. Well, maybe Western Australia wouldn't be COVID-free, it would be Victoria, and all of Australia would have had 
the problems that Victoria had with private security. So I'm just wondering if you could comment a little bit or maybe try to see the federalism glass as half, it is, as half full, not half empty, and, and think a little bit about the counterfactual and more of a comparative perspective. Upside to diversity? Yeah, well, I mean, that, that, that's sort of self-evidently true. Um, and I, but I guess another way of putting it is that um, because there were six different governments, the same mistakes weren't replicated across the whole nation. And that is a good thing, I agree. And, and it's also well acknowledged that representation needs to have a le level of localism to it in order to work. So, you know, in order for people to feel like they're represented, those, the government needs to be reasonably close to them. So um, I'm not saying federalism cannot work. And in fact, I agree with you that if you look at the performance of Australia in the early months of the, uh, the pandemic, because that national cabinet worked so well, because they sort of decided to chuck out all that, all that bureaucratic process and rigidity and just you know, get rid of the bureaucrats and just talk leader to leader and so forth. They did make a lot of fast decisions and get them implemented, but we're seeing now how poorly thought through some of those things are. But I certainly acknowledge your point that, um, uh, you know, if it had been left to a single government, and let's, let's assume it was left to the federal government, then we wouldn't have had a whole number of the restrictions that we had, the social distancing that was very important in containing the virus. I mean, Morrison was basically opposed to border closures. He was opposed to school closures. He was opposed, he wanted businesses to open up much earlier than they did, even in the um, so-called model states. Uh, and he'd certainly be opposed to the borders that are, that are closed still now. So you wouldn't have COVID-free jurisdictions. So I'd, I'd concede the point. Uh, none of this is, um, you know, uh, all one way and not the other. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you know, in your opening comments, for example, you, you make the point about the failure to, to, to move forward on Indigenous recognition and the delivery of, um, you, know, prop, you know, meaningful reconciliation. Well, you know, there's a good example. We can squeeze one more quick one in if it's quick, I think. Uh, well, there was one just here. Yes. Yeah, thanks. So it seems to me that by any measure, the constitution is way out of date, obviously in relation to indigenous people, but a whole lot else besides. I'm wondering if you think it would be possible to initiate a process for radically rewriting the constitution and perhaps reflect on what Henry Parks would do. Yes, well, that's a very good question. I don't claim to be a scholar of Henry Parks, so I, and, the, and I'm conscious of the fact that there are a couple in the room. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, and who would be much better positioned to, you know, authoritatively answer what he might do. But it's a really interesting point about the idea of modernising the constitution and perhaps even doing so essentially from the ground up, to, you know, literally starting the whole process again. And I have, have heard, and in fact there may be some work going on at ANU along, this, uh, along these lines, I have heard of uh, some talk of, of actually doing this, of, of looking at a process um, that would no doubt take years and be highly contested and need to go through a number of different stages and iterations, but which would look at, um, at rewriting the Australian Constitution. And I'll just say this without naming anyone, but one very prominent academic who may or may not have an American accent and a Nobel Prize is, is of the view uh, that the... And it's a very considered view that the you read the American Constitution and it is an uplifting and poetic document. You read the Australian Constitution and it's a turgid, technical, you know, dirge. Uh, so uh, perhaps there is something to be said for that for that process. And uh, you know, all I can say is watch this space, but don't expect any uh, dramatic changes in the uh, short term. Thank you. I think that's probably time and I'm passing back to Ian Tom. Thank you very much, Professor Mark Kenny. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen, for conducting that for us. And Mark, thank you. Uh, uh, inspirational and broad oration you've given us. Plenty of things to talk about. and. Uh, I think if old Henry was around, he'd still say, we have work to do. 
Um, just by way of interest, um, when Henry wrote The Empire, his first editorial he wrote, he entitled it, Colonial Radicalism, Our Own Creed. And part of this, he reads, our duty as a radical journalist is to make the voice of complaint in such case loud and general till the cause be removed. If, for example, any department of the government should ever be so impregnated by corruption as to become a source of favour and an aggrandisement to an individual or party at the expense of the community, then there is clearly work for us and we shall put away all fear and affection in the performance of it. Not much has changed. <laughs> but Mark, uh, allow me just to look backwards too, because you think uh, over in, in the um, National Gallery, Tom Roberts' big picture, uh, and, and the big picture there, and including in that uh, big picture, right high up on the wall is a replica of the Julian Ashton uh, painting of Henry Parks. Looking down on the Duke, all those individually painted faces there, uh, you know, for the whole proceedings. But what really is famous about that, that big picture is this shaft of sunlight coming down expressing a bright future for a federated Australia. And your oration has been a big picture view and, and complete, let's hope, that shaft of sunlight helps complete the unfinished business. I have a small few little things here for you as a way of thanks. A 1996 one dollar silver proof that was made of 100 years of Henry's death in 2015, 200 years of his birth, we made a medallion, and it's uh, poet, patriot, publisher, premier. And it says, he left his adopted country a better place. That's to remember Henry. Thank you very much. But to remember the foundation, I'll give you our book, The Crimson Thread. And you mentioned Susan Ryan, the late Susan Ryan, and she is the first entry in the book. So that's a bit serendipitous. So thank you all and thank you for coming and to the live audience out there, we hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. <laughs>